So we got researchers over here making some progress on our next gen gap generators. And these guys here are delving into some weather manipulation tech. Oh, and these guys here are cooking up some pretty sweet upgrades for our Thor gunships. Hmm, interesting. What about those guys you got in Nunavut? What are they doing there? Oh, uh, nothing. Just helping you guys organize the ongoing resistance efforts in the mainland US. <laughs> nothing much. <laughs> Don't worry about it. The raid on Galenjik was a resounding success for the Allies. Even now, spirits are high among the US rebels after news of the Midas warhead's destruction reached their ears. Fearing increasing rebel activities, and with most of their forces pulled towards the European front, the High Command had no choice but to reluctantly agree to the construction of several psychic beacons to strengthen their hold on the continent, such as the one erected in Washington, D.C. Nevertheless, this was a wake-up call for the Russian High Command, a sharp reminder that they have become complacent. Thus, the Russians have stopped bothering with their slow, piecemeal absorption of their former territories, and have now commenced the Blitzkrieg of Europe, just as in the last war. Even with their ultimate deterrent erased from their arsenal, the Russians still refrained from deploying psychic beacons in the European front, much to the Allies' bewilderment. Instead, numerous new armaments began seeing deployment in the front lines. While the Midas warheads that took them decades to make were all but destroyed in the Allied raid, the Soviets still possessed a sizable number of tactical nuclear missiles and have begun constructing silos sporadically to help break through fortified enemy positions. Interestingly though, the High Command had decided not to make the news of the warhead's destruction public to their commanders in fear of lowering troop morale. So these deployments may very well be meant to serve a secondary purpose of reinforcing that lie. Furthermore, the Soviets' efforts on rebuilding their air force has finally bore fruit. As the first wave of Foxtrots, their next generation jet fighters armed with incendiary missiles are finally ready for field combat. In addition to the Wolfhound, an aerial weapons platform that has just recently entered mass production stage, newly developed vehicles also began rolling out of the factories, such as the Scud Launcher, an all-new launching platform meant as a successor to the V2 rocket launcher from the Second Great War, and the Tesla Cruiser, a fully tracked vehicle armed with two turret-mounted Tesla coils, its efficiency outclassing both the old Mammoth and the Apocalypse tank. Most of the Sino-Russian coalition had been concentrated on the push into Germany and the Czech Republic. With the help of the new units, they were able to make substantial advances despite suffering significant casualty, with their vanguard forces soon reaching Bohemia. Elsewhere, the Confederation has brought in a large number of bomb buggies into the European theater, allowing them to rapidly bulldoze through key allied fortifications in Spain. Furthermore, an amphibious assault from two Russian commanders managed to destroy a large allied supply base in Copenhagen, Denmark severely weakening the remainder of the Allied Baltic fleet. Interestingly, the famed Soviet general was not allowed to participate in this intense campaign. His success in Paris had barely lowered the suspicion placed on him. On the contrary, his constant victories against the odds are beginning to scare the high command, to the point where there's even talks of having him thrown in the gulag. The Soviet general may very well have to consider a future where he may need to run from Moscow and establish his own foothold instead in the US. And if he does, then this next task assigned to him will be twice as invaluable. The invasion into Canada led by Colonel Krukov and Reznov has been wildly successful thus far, and has also led to the discovery of a large joint communications network between the Euro Alliance and the Pacific Front, located in Devon Island, Nunavut. The discovery of this junction came rather late in the campaign, and the reasoning seems to be behind a new invention the Allies are deploying en masse. The Gap Generator, a device capable of creating effective dead zones in satellite imaging and active radar monitoring. Preliminary scans suggest that the base is used to help coordinate the ongoing resistance efforts in America. The American POWs in the Soviet General's care, however, have informed them that most of the US remnants actually despise their so-called allies for abandoning them in their time of need. Meaning that there is a very real possibility that this base is actually used to obtain American military assets and secrets instead. If so, then the Soviet general could use this opportunity to endear himself to the American people by destroying these vultures that call themselves America's friends. A team of saboteurs was sent into the area using a brainwashed Allied pilot, and successfully infiltrated the European communications tower within the joint base. Upon analysis, the data confirmed the general's suspicion that this place is being used to extract technology from the remaining US bases. Furthermore, the Pacific Front had already managed to obtain access to the Americans' prized Mercury satellite network, which allows them to fire devastating orbital laser strikes wherever they so choose, so long as connection is maintained with a nearby node. This also proves that the base had clearly been operating for quite some time now, as the orbital laser strike that destroyed the Eiffel Tower was most definitely fired from one of the Mercury satellites at the behest of the Pacific Front. 
Realizing the extent of the operation being conducted at this joint base, NMCV was immediately deployed onto the scene for the Soviet general to prevent further extraction of US tech. Noticing the presence of Soviet forces in the area, the European and Pacific armies decided to eliminate the threat early by charging a Mercury strike on the Soviet general's base. In an attempt to destroy the Allied base before suffering the orbital attack, the Soviet general was quickly given clearance to several Confederation units, as well as an array of new inventions. Additionally, several American vehicles in operational condition were also provided to the general by some American defectors who were furious upon learning the truth uncovered here. Even Colonel Krukov and Reznov themselves soon arrived on the battlefield to assist the Soviet general. Despite the numerous reinforcements at the general's disposal, they were unable to break into the Allied bases in time due to their enemy's new inventions, namely these never-before-seen prism towers and prism tanks. Just when they thought the operation was going to be a failure, the unexpected occurred. The Mercury strike fired upon the Soviet general's base did little more than scratch some red paint off of it. It seems both the Soviets and Allies have overestimated the weapon's recharging capabilities, and its firepower has greatly diminished after its strike on the Eiffel Tower. Without fear of succumbing to the Mercury strikes, the Soviet general relaxed his speedy offensive, and slowly destroyed the bases with the reinforcements from the Russian Atlantic fleet. News of this victory spread like wildfire. And soon, the first real free Americans joined the Soviet cause, sealing their indomitable hold on the American continent. Though that is far from the end of this discovery. The intel recovered from the Devon Island base has yielded far more fruits than anticipated. The carelessness of the Allied agents at the joint base resulted in a wave of massive leaks of confidential intel to the Soviets, netting them the location of whopping four points of interest. Here, 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 and here all of which are research facilities located at various parts of Europe, operating within the jurisdiction of Steins Tech, the Euro Alliance's number one advanced technology firm. This presents a most excellent opportunity for the Soviets to sabotage much of the Allies' technological advancements, and they most certainly need to, for if these technologies are anything like the new bothersome prism tech they encountered on the island of Devon, then they must be nipped in the bud before they are ready. And thus, a series of surgical strikes were swiftly conducted across Europe. Their prior victory at the city of Copenhagen allowed the Soviets to launch attacks on two of the four facilities. The first, located in Rosendal, Norway, where the next generation gap generators are being developed by the Euro Alliance's industrial firms. The second, located in Ongemanland, Sweden, where the Europeans are working on powerful prototype armaments for their Thor gunships. In an effort to avoid weakening their push into Germany, the task forces assigned to attack these facilities are relatively small in size. To compensate for this, the Russian heroes Bokov and Chitskoy joined their fight alongside several apocalypse tanks. These behemoths are arguably the most powerful units in the Soviet arsenal, but due to cost efficiency issues, are currently not in active production, with only a few units left in service. On the other hand, the Latin Confederation is granted access to an Iron Curtain device, as well as some Sycor tech to offset their still developing arsenal. With these advanced units at their disposal, the Soviets were able to destroy these two facilities and erase any data of the work being done there. While the Russian strike forces were operating in the Baltic states, the Sycor snuck into yet another European and Pacific joint research facility located in Allensbach, Germany, and eliminated every single one of the experimental weather control crystals within the base, significantly delaying the project's completion and forcing the relocation of the joint venture team to continue the project elsewhere. While this series of events was unfolding, the Soviet general was assigned to yet another task his target this time being the American Pacific Fleet HQ at Pearl Harbor, Hawaii. Or that's what he thought his target was, until the day of the attack. Upon closer analysis, it appears that the American base was actually taken control of by the Pacific Front. Even better, the Americans' only remaining Mercury network uplink that is still connected to the titular satellite network is sited within base. It is from this singular network uplink that the Pacific Front had managed to wrest control of the Mercury satellite network away from the Americans, and why they were able to issue orbital laser strikes on the Soviet forces for the past few weeks. Because their control over the satellite network is incomplete, however, the orbital strikes thus far have been mostly weak and sporadic. But given time, the Pacific Front might be able to realize the full devastating potential of the weapon. To completely remove the threat of Mercury strikes, the High Command fully restored the Soviet General's weapons protocol and ordered him to take down the space with the help of Confederation forces, even granting him access to a tactical nuclear silo. The Soviet General easily destroyed the Allied outpost on the nearby Nihau Island and established his foothold there, allowing him to build up a strike force of his own. Fierce retaliation from the Pacific Front ensued, hurling a constant meteor shower towards the General with Zephyr artillery groups as their ships assailed the outpost. 
With the help of Yuri's genetically modified giant squids, however, the Pacific Navy was unable to breach the general's defenses. With several tactical nukes at his disposal, he was able to break through the Pacific Front Army's defenses and successfully destroy the Mercury Network uplink, completely cutting the Pacific Front, as well as the Americans, off from accessing their famed satellite network. Given time and opportunity, the Soviet general might have been able to seize the satellites for his own use, but at least there won't be any threat of Mercury strikes for the immediate future. The speed and ferocity with which the Soviets acted within the last few weeks was more than worrying to the Euro Alliance, showing them that even with the destruction of the Midas warheads, the war is far from being in their favor. Although two European commanders were able to slow down the Confederation's advance somewhat in Spain by intercepting a considerable portion of their bomb buggies in Alcazarin, the situation does not look nearly as good everywhere else. Their joint base with the Pacific Front in Nunavut, responsible for extracting US tech, was not only destroyed by the Soviets, but also resulted in crucial intel leaks that led to the destruction of many of their advanced research facilities. Worse, some were even captured by the Soviets, and the weapons developed within them may one day serve the Reds instead. For now, this information, as well as the true purpose behind the Nunavut Joint Base, is kept a closely guarded secret from the American Expedition Forces. But it won't be long before relevant rumors surface from the US mainland and reach them here in Europe. Infighting with the Americans is a prospect they wish to avoid at any cost, especially right now when they still need their help. Recent news from the US Special Agent Tanya Adams has revealed to them that the Chinese involvement in the European theater is much deeper than they had previously presumed. The Chinese had constructed a secret base in Zakopane, Poland, and had been supplying their forward troops with advanced nuclear-powered weaponry for the past few days. Thankfully, Tanya, with the help of a small US strike force as well as some European POWs, was able to destroy the two atom hearts responsible for researching and producing said nuclear weapons. Still, the Chinese vanguard forces pushed on and are soon to rendezvous with the main Russian battalion in Bohemia, where the Russians are planning their next offensive. With the Mercury control station destroyed, one of their most powerful communications tools was now out of the reach for the Allies, forcing them to rely on radar dome arrays for long-range contact and coordination. The Soviets too know this, and has launched an attack on the European position in the Jezera Mountains with their vanguard forces, where the Allies' most powerful communications array at the present stands. Although the Soviets did not completely break through this position, they still managed to capture three of the five radar domes, severing the Europeans' only route of stable communications left with the Pacific Front. The Reds seem keen on breaking through this position and have even constructed a tactical nuclear silo in the area, soon to be ready for use. A major crisis, for sure, especially for Steins Tech, who were in close collaboration with several scientists from Japan's Kanagawa Industries in regards to the Paradox Project. Ever since their defeat on the Devon Island, the communications between the Euro Alliance and the Pacific Front have been sporadic at best, as both were kept busy trying to cover their own tracks due to the intel leaks. If the Paradox Project is to be finished, however, then they must re-establish proper communications channel with the Pacific Front. To help with the retaking of the radar domes, the now famous Allied commander was sent into the area to command the local forces, and Siegfried, leader of the Steins Tech and the late Einstein's protege, has also arrived on the battlefield aboard the Zeitgeist a massive hovercraft armed with cutting-edge chrono technology, capable of firing small deadly chrono vortexes. With the two leading the charge, the Allies were able to hold their grounds against the attackers, not only destroying the tactical nuke silo, but also retaking all of the radar domes in the area. Knowing they will only be able to hold the position for a limited time, the Europeans quickly sought to contact the Pacific Front again, successfully rallying most of the remaining Pacific troops overseas to Europe, while simultaneously establishing contact with those stationed in Japan. What they learned, however, turned out far bleaker than they had imagined. The People's Republic of China had entered war with Japan and has already occupied large parts of the country, for quite some time now, in fact. It seems Europe wasn't the only place they spread their influence to. While the rest of the Allied nations were busy battling Soviet Russia and the Latin Confederation, the Pacific Front had become the primary target of China's full-scale invasion spanning the entirety of Asia. Their operations in India and other South Asian countries were very successful, as the Allies would have expected. But the rapid fall of Japan, a core member of the Pacific Front, was definitely not on their bingo card for the Third Great War. Unbeknownst to all other parties, China has secretly allied themselves with certain traitorous groups in the Pacific Front, who supported their aggression from within. Intel from the Allied Loyalists suggests that these traitors are part of the same groups that previously cooperated with China during Japan's independence referendum and are backed by the same arms manufacturers antagonistic to the Allied cause. This unholy alliance, 
signed without consent from other Pacific Front parties, has completely undermined the purpose of the organization. The Allies should have seen this much earlier, but the fact that they didn't has now made them believe that Yuri and the Psych Corps had been obscuring them to the truth for possibly months, if not years for now. The resulting fallout is much more severe than the Allies could have imagined. With help from the inside, the Chinese were able to conquer large chunks of Japan with relative ease. Most of the research facilities belonging to the Kanagawa Industries had been seized by the traders from within. The few that refused to turn were instead met with brutal force. Some of the facilities had been developing powerful weapons utilizing cutting-edge technology. Others were dedicated to the secret research and continuation of stolen US assets. Then there are some that are doing both, like this one in Miyazaki where reverse-engineered Chinese EMP tech had culminated in the construction of a structure capable of wide-range signal interference, and the prototypes of a fully automated laser tank derived from the schematics extracted from US bases is undergoing production here as well. Each one of these inventions is capable of turning the tides of battles were they to be finished, but with the occupation of Japan, many of these projects were either put on hold, destroyed, or have fallen into Chinese hands. That in fact is precisely the reason why China had proceeded with the invasion. Despite a few voices of opposition, the PRC leadership had decided to move forward with a project known to outsiders only as the Great Rewrite Plan, and the advanced technologies being developed in Japan are seemingly crucial to that project. Obviously, China has kept all of this under wraps from the rest of the coming term, as the treaties they signed before the war would have required them to share the extracted technology with the entire Soviet Union, and they most definitely do not plan on honoring that agreement. There's still one thing that doesn't add up though. The PRC shouldn't have been able to mobilize this much manpower when they've been busy dealing with increasing separatist activities inland for quite a while now. Had they finally plucked this storm by their side without the allies noticing? If so, how did they do it? It was Yuri, of course. What did you expect? While his second-in-command was dealing with the prototype MCV incident, Yuri had made a secret deal with the Chinese leadership, a psychic beacon, to be constructed in Xizang to subdue the insurgents. In exchange, China must help Yuri find and obtain certain persons of interest per his requirements. To help facilitate this search, the Psych Corps is allowed a degree of operational freedom inside China, as well as the Japanese lands conquered by them. With one exception, Kanago Industries research facilities. Now, Yuri being who he is, obviously did not abide by this rule, for he too wanted a slice of the technological pie. When the Chinese attacked the Kanagawa Industries headquarters in Kagoshima, Yuri had placed the Chinese commander under a trance while the proselyte took over his outpost in the area. Disguised as Chinese forces, the proselyte smashed through the defenses with powerful Chinese weapons at his disposal, forcing the local PF garrison to surrender before the second wave of Chinese forces arrived. This swift victory gave the proselyte ample time to cover their tracks, and more importantly, extract crucial data from the facility which will become useful for bolstering Yuri's forces in the future. <laughs> With the fall of their headquarters and the capitulation of most of their facilities, the remaining KI scientists loyal to the Allied cause had no choice but to go into hiding. Those that were collaborating with Stein's tech on the Paradox project in particular are holed up in the Myoshinji Temple in Kyoto. Given time, the Chinese would surely apprehend these scientists, and their indispensable expertise would then be forever lost to the Allies. To secure the future of the Paradox Project, and by extension, that of the entire free world, Siegfried has resorted to rescuing the scientists with the only solution left, the Chronosphere. After the last war had ended, Einstein came to the opinion that meddling with the forces of time and space was dangerous and unethical, and would only bring about catastrophes and desolation. As such, he had decided to encrypt nearly all the data related to the Paradox Project before he died, a key component of which is the Chronosphere, a temporal manipulation device capable of warping any inorganic object from one point in space to another. But even so, Einstein knew that there may come a time where the forces of freedom may have need for the Chronosphere once again. With the clues left behind by Einstein, Siegfried and members of the Steins Tech had managed to assemble the next generation version of Chronosphere, albeit a prototype, still under development at the Steins Tech lab in Germany's Black Forest. This new design is miles ahead of the first iteration, not only allowing the teleportation of multiple vehicles at once, but also guaranteeing the safety of the passengers. Despite the improvements, its chance of causing chrono vortexes still exists at a minuscule level. But the device works, and that is what matters right now. Hiding inside a truck, a covert Pacific Front agent managed to make his way into the area, where he found a prototype Tsurugi power suit that was smuggled in earlier. Under the instructions of the Allied commander, the agent was able to deftly avoid the Chinese patrols and locate all four of the KI scientists in hiding. 
All of them were then loaded onto a battle tortoise, and summarily chrono shifted to the Steins Tech Lab in the Black Forest. Holy shit, where are we? The teleportation was slightly off by a few miles, much to the Allies' dismay. A miscalculation they attributed to glitches yet to be resolved in the prototype chronosphere. What they didn't know at the time, however, was that this was no accident. Not long ago, the Soviets, fresh with Chinese divisions, managed to break through Bohemia, overtaking the communications hub, and have set up a front line at the Black Forest's edge. This was the fourth facility leak from Devon Island, and the Soviets had long since known the existence of the chronosphere in the Black Forest lab. While the Russians were preparing for an attack on the Allied base at Fort Dukum, the Chinese dispatched a separate division which circled to the back of the Steinstech lab. Their troops in Japan had informed them about the Allies' plan to use the chronosphere to move the KI scientists. This separate task force was the attempt to sabotage that plan. Yuen Ru, a young prodigy and one of China's leading scientists, accompanied this task force. She alone is capable of hacking into the chronosphere should she get close enough to the device. Escorted by her comrades, Yuen Ru was able to do so successfully before the chrono shift happened, disrupting the Allies' plan to move the KI scientists to the lab. Due to this hiccup, the dynamic of the battle had shifted significantly. While the Steins Tech Lab is well protected, the scientists much less so. Now that the PRC forces in Kyoto were able to inform their European front of the convoy's identity, they had become the primary target of the Soviet troops in the area. The Allies' number one priority now is to get the convoy to the Black Forest Lab as soon as possible. But the shortest path towards the base is through this canyon, making it hard for the escorts to retaliate against enemy aggression from above the cliffs. Eager to ensure the safety of the convoy, Siegfried and a group of European soldiers hastily rushed to its aid. They brought with them several Zephyr artillery units, a design shared by the Pacific Front, ideal for circumventing the terrain disadvantage. With the Allied commander's help, the Chrono Convoy was able to navigate through the difficult terrain filled with ambushes while the local defenders did their best to distract their enemies. After a tumultuous journey, they managed to deliver the scientists to the lab without harm. Unable to prevent the arrival of the convoy, the Soviets instead resorted to sieging the laboratory itself. Luckily for the Allies, the dense forests of the area gave them the perfect environment to deploy their mirage tanks and camo pillboxes, stalling the enemy's advance at every turn. The few scud launchers they did manage to get in range of the base were thwarted instead by the Europeans' short-term force fields. From there, the Allied commander marshaled his forces and utilized the advanced prism weapons at his disposal to destroy the equally well-equipped Sino-Russian forces in the area. With this victory, the safety of the scientists are now guaranteed. With them free to continue their work on the Chronosphere and the Paradox Project without worry, they might soon be able to fully complete the device instrumental to the Allied retaliation efforts. Once they do, they will have the ultimate advantage of the Soviets, and bring swift justice upon the- Ah, oh, not this shit again!